So, you have your miniatures primed and you're all ready for painting, but what paints to use? Nick speaking, and welcome to this video. Right time for another Back to Basics video. And in this one, I want to have a look at paint. Now, as always, these videos are aimed for beginners, uh, but I hope the information in it is useful to you. And uh, yeah, let's have a chat about paint. Okay, so paint, uh, where to start? I'm gonna start right at the beginning. Um, and of course here, I'm only sharing my own personal experience. Um, but I started with the Gaines Workshop paint range um, and I've never really looked back. Uh, now the reason why I went for Gaines Workshop range is because I could obtain it easily uh, locally. Um, and to be fair, I've been very happy with the range of paint. Now they have made a few dodgy ones, but on the whole, uh, the paint range is excellent um, and they've certainly been pushing the boundaries um, with their paint recently as well with the new range that they've got. Um, now I have used other paint ranges, I've used Army Painter, I've used Vallejo, and they're all very good. And to be fair I wouldn't necessarily recommend one over the other, but what I would say is uh, get one which is convenient and easy for you to obtain, because the most important thing is uh, when you run out of a paint is that you can easily get hold of one so you can carry on painting. If you can select a paint range which is quite well known, that's probably a good idea as well, um, because there's nothing worse than having your army sort of half painted and then you can't get hold of the paint anymore. So let's say you go to, um, I don't know, say Poundland and they do some cheap paints and you buy them and they might work pretty well. Um, but then like a year later, they probably don't do them anymore. And then you're halfway through painting your army, you can't match the colors up and it can become a nightmare. Now even sticking with the big brands like Citadel, um, that still can cause a problem, and indeed it's caused me a problem recently where I've been painting my Aldar army in this lich or light purple. That's the other thing with Citadel paint names is no one can pronounce the names. Well, Duncan can <laughs> from Warhammer TV. Um, I only watched their video so I could work out how to pronounce the names. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, so, yeah, Citadel recently changed their paint range now they changed it for various reasons i think the main one being that they wanted a paint range which was unique to them whereas their previous paint range was uh, a, you, other companies could actually get hold of it uh, so they changed their uh, range of paints they tried to match them up as best they could but they are different and the new however you pronounce it zero xerox purple um, is totally different from the light purple and it's caused me a lot of hassle um, however um, like I said the old paint uh, was available in other brands so um, in particular the Vallejo uh, game color their purple and in particular the game range of their paints is exactly the same paint that's in here and this is an exact match uh, so I was able to overcome that um, but the point is uh, really to try and stick to um, a, a well-known brand so that you don't run into trouble uh, sometime in the future. Okay, so um, what do we need to talk about paints? Well, generally, let's just bring these three paints in. When you buy paints, they usually come in different uh, types. So let's just look at these oranges here. You've got um, the Jokero orange, which is a base color. Then you have Troll Slayer orange, which is a layer. Uh, this one here, the Fire Dragon Bright, is also a layer. And generally, the paints are made and designed to work with each other. So obviously, in this case, you would lay down your base coat first. You would then highlight it up with the uh, Troll Slayer orange layered paint. And then you do a stream um, edge highlight or something with the Fire Dragon Bright highlight paint. Um, and indeed, I, th I think they actually do some highlight paints. Um, but either way, uh, the point here is that the ranges of paints generally do match up. Um, and if you're happy to buy the individual pots, 
then that's great. I mean, that's what I do. I like to buy the individual pots rather than mixing my own recipes up. Um, and the reason for that is, once again, um, in the future, it's just easier to match up a pot of paint than it is to match up a recipe that you've made, even if you do write it down. So personally, I prefer to buy the individual paints and actually use those to work with. Now, talking of recipes, um, I have a little notebook and I suggest that you get yourself a notebook um, and write down exactly what you do. It's a bit bright here, let's see if I can tone down this a bit. There we go. So as you can see, I mean, this is my fire dragons and I've written down how I've done the orange. Um, highlights, all the washes, the mixes, 50-50 mix of these two colours, etc. How I did the yellow. Um, so I've written everything down in this little notebook. This is how I did my avatar lava. Uh, this is really, really useful to basically reference back. Uh, now I'm in a position where I obviously have my videos as well. Sometimes I'll actually watch a video back to find out how I painted something. But um, writing it all down on a notebook is really, really useful. Uh, now sometimes um, you may find that only you can decipher what you've written down, like in this case. Um, but um, yeah, as long as you've got a reference point, that's the, the main thing. So get yourself a little notebook as well, that's really, really useful. Okay, so let's talk about the actual paint itself. Uh, let's get this exposure back up again. There you go. Right, um, you'll notice with the paints that they also have different consistencies uh, depending on the colour. So some may be a bit more, let's say, gloppy. Um, for example, this Yashati bone is generally quite a gloppy, thicker paint than, say, this one here. This is Cantor Blue, which generally is quite a nice, consistent, thinner sort of paint. Now, the key thing when using paint is to give them a very good shake before you use them, um, especially these type of paints here where they are a bit thicker and gloppier. Uh, so give them a good shake. Now you can assist the shake with a small ball bearing. You could pop one of those in, alternatively a little stone, a little off cut of green stuff, um, something like that, just pop it into the pot so that when you shake it the ball can move around and it just mixes it up a little bit easier. Now obviously I'm using the Games Workshop uh, paint pots, I know a lot of people don't like them, I don't have too many issues with them to be fair. Um, of course the other type of paint pot is a dropper bo bottle like this one. Now personally I don't actually like these that much and I'll tell you the reason for that, I had a bad experience I got um, the paint out, um, I only wanted a very, very tiny bit of paint and um, I basically started to squeeze it to try and get a tiny little piece of paint out. I didn't realise that the paint had like, dried in the tip and then I squeezed it and it went everywhere. Um, yeah, it wasn't pretty. So I don't actually like them, I prefer these. And yes, okay, you get paint. Um, I mean, to be fair, I'm just lazy and I don't clean my paint pots. I could easily get rid of this and clean it up, but I don't. Um, so they do get a bit messy now and again, but I could easily just pull that out if I wanted to. Now, some people uh, do like to paint directly from the pot. Now, I don't actually do that um, very often. Uh, occasionally I do. Uh, and one big complaint with these lids is that the sort of lid doesn't really stay open very well. If it does, and it's the paint starts glopping outside of the lid. Um, so what I do is I use a paint brush top, and then I just lift it up and pop that into there. And then it stays open nicely, and as you can see, it's still dripping inside, not outside of the lid. So that's just a little tip. If you did want to paint from the actual uh, pot itself, now, if you are doing that, then um, what you need to do is dip your paintbrush into a, um, into a little cup of water. 
And now don't actually dip your paintbrush right the way in, but just the tip, just pick up a tiny piece of water in your paintbrush um, before you dip it into the paint, because we want to talk about the next stage uh, here, and that is thinning your paints. Now each paint itself, depending on the type of paint that you're going to be using, will need a different, different level of uh, thinning. Uh, but it is essential pretty much with any colour that you use to thin it down um, even just a small amount. Uh, now the, the main way to thin down your paint is going to be with water. Uh, we are going to discuss some other stuff in a minute as well. Um, but yeah, water um, is your, the way to do it. And you'll probably hear people talk about a milky consistency. Um, or like a consistency like milk. And to be fair, that's about right. That's the type of consistency you're looking at. Um, so you don't want it to be really thin and watery, um, but you don't want it to be thick. Now the reason why we're thinning our paints down is because we don't want to leave any brush marks. Now we're gonna talk about this more in the future, but the key things as well to not leaving brush marks. Um, as well as thinning your paints is once you've put down a layer of paint is not to rework it until it's dry. No matter how dreadful it looks, especially if it's the first coat of paint that goes down, you probably will see a brush mark. But if you're thin, your paints are thin enough, you won't actually be putting a brush mark on there. It will just be um, like a, a leftover where the colour hasn't been built up enough. Uh, but the key thing there is not to go back in and start reworking it until it's totally dry. So we've talked about uh, painting directly from the pot, which as I said I don't generally do. Um, what a lot of people will do is they'll use one of these or something similar. Um, I know some people use an old CD piece of plastic, um, you know, they're, they're even their table. Um, but uh, yeah, basically so you can take the paint out of the pot and you can pop it onto somewhere and then you can add your water and you can see the consistency, you can actually get your brush and just drag it out and you can see how it's painting. One thing I will do if I haven't got yet this here is I'll actually use the back of my thumbnail here um, and actually just paint on here first just to see what the consistency of the paint is like. Uh, now this works well, the main disadvantage with this, especially if it's a hot day um, or if you're in a house that has maybe the central heating on, is that this will dry very, very quickly, um, especially if you've put on a very small amount of paint. Um, so you need to watch out for that because obviously when it dries it gets thicker and you're back to not having um, a thin paint anymore and the risk of having a brush mark. Um, on your model. So what I do is I have a wet palette. Now I have a tutorial on how I make this wet palette and I will put a link to that in the description below so check that out if you're interested. But yeah this is a free wet palette that I made. Um, it's a Chinese takeaway dish. Now this palette here is just about to be changed. I've just literally finished um, using it. So basically I've got an old sponge in there and that's filled with water. Um, on the top I've got some baking um, paper and of course as you can see I've got paint on there. Now this is paint from ages ago, this is from my warp spiders and you can see the paint is still wet. That's been there about three or four weeks. Um, and this is obviously from my Necrons that I've just recently painted. Now you'll notice some of the silver colours not on here. That's because when I'm using dry brush um, stuff um, I'll use that uh, uh, palette thing that I showed you earlier, put the silver on there and then um, use that to dry brush because I know I'll be using that quite quickly but anything that I know is going to take a good few hours to paint or maybe I'm going to be going back to the next day then a wet palette is a really really good idea. Okay so that is the wet palette. Uh, now we talked about water and water um, is a fantastic place to start in terms of thinning your paints. Um, but don't be surprised when you hear that some of the top painters uh, will be using additional material to thin their paints. There's actually quite a number of different products around. Excuse the blank screen, but I am now going to bring something in. From my point of view, I use two additional things um, to not just only using water. 
So the first one I use is this one here. Now this is by Liquitex. Now I get this from uh, my art supplier, Ken Bromley. Um, I'll put a link to Ken Bromley's website in the description below. Uh, so this is a uh, slow dry fluid retarder. Now effectively all this does is it waters down the paint as if it, you were using water. Uh, but it's got an extra agent in there which slows down the drying process of that paint. Um, now that's not necessary, I mean that could be useful I suppose if you didn't have a wet palette. Uh, but it's not designed for that, it's designed for slowing down the drying time physically on your model. And that is very very useful if you're going to be doing things like wet blending. Where you want to blend one paint colour into another paint colour. Uh, if you have your paint wet uh, for longer, it's easier to do that wet blending. So uh, liquid retarder, fluid retarder is always a good one to have um, in your rack as such. Now this one here has a nice little uh, dropper so you can easily just squeeze out a drop um, at a time. Now the other product which I use quite a lot is this one. Now this is actually Windsor and Newton, but I got it from the same place, uh, Ken Bromley. Uh, and this is called Flow Improver. Now effectively this does exactly the same. It waters down the paint, uh, makes the paint a little bit thinner. Uh, but in this instance, it also makes the paint more translucent, uh, more see-through. Um, and this is ideal if you want to do very, very thin layers where um, you maybe want to blend a little transition in. Um, let's just say, for example, you're painting skin on a face um, and you're going up um, highlighting in layers. If you add some of this to your paint, it will make that paint more translucent. It will make it blend in a little bit more as the highlights go on. Um, very, very useful. Uh, also really, really good if you're doing dry blending. Now I've mentioned wet blending, I'm now talking about dry blending. Don't worry, we are going to cover both of those techniques in the painting side of the videos sometime in the future. Um, so yeah, if you're doing dry blending, which is where you're blending um, a wet paint onto a dry paint, uh, this stuff is fantastic for helping you achieve those results. Now if you open up the lid of this one, there is no dropper on this one. So what I use, I just went to Boots and got myself one of these little syringes. Um, and I can put that in, I can then just put out some and then uh, push out a little drop into the paint. And that works really, really well. So uh, yeah, it's like I don't know, a quid or something for that syringe. Now there is uh, this stuff as well, this is the Citadel Technical Laha Medium. Uh, now effectively this is exactly the same as the Flow Improver. Um, it's uh, Citadel's version where you can uh, thin down your paints, make it more translucent. Um, it is great for uh, helping you blend. Um, it's also great for making up little glazes, uh, which is uh, where you thin down your paint so much um, that you can um, use it a little bit like a thin wash over your models. Now, um, the reason why I don't tend to use this so much as the Flow Improver is because it's not quite as economic. Um, you know, this small paint pot here full of this stuff compared to how much you get in this pot for the cost, this is much, much better value for money. So I tend to use this more so than this one. Okay, so I think that covers the majority stuff on actual paint itself. Uh, the only thing I would say is um, that when you're painting your models, try not to actually touch the paint that you've uh, painted. Obviously not when it's wet, but um, also not when it's dry. Because what will tend to happen is uh, the oil from your fingers will actually uh, damage the paint. It will make it rub off, etc. If you go again into boots, you can buy some cotton gloves. Um, I sometimes wear those if I'm handling um, a model. But more often than not, I'll use things like this. This is a cork, uh, especially if I'm using a paper clip with the pin model, which I'm going to be doing with that model that I've uh, built for this series. Um, if you don't have a paper clip in the foot of your model, you could maybe use an old paint pot 
and then put some uh, blue tack on it and then blue tack your model on there. Uh, now there are some elaborate um, model holding devices and I've actually recently looked at um, a Kickstarter which had some really really cool um, holding devices which I have to admit I'm probably considering getting some at some point um, but um, you know waiting for some money for that. Um, but yeah, don't don't actually hold your model, and it generally is easier to to paint your model if you've got something to hold it like this. It's just more comfortable to be able to paint your model when you've got something to hold, rather than trying to hold the base and and doing it this way. It's a lot more difficult. Okay, so I think that's it uh, for this video on paint. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the video. I hope there was something in there that was useful to you. Um, of course we are going to continue the series, uh, the next episode will be about paint brushes, so keep an eye out for that one next week. Right, that's it for me then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.